Hello, this is Eric Strong again from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. This is the fifth lecture in this series on mechanical ventilation and the topic is monitoring gas exchange. Here are the learning objectives of this lecture. First, to understand what physiologic values are acquired from the AVG and where this information can be applied. Second, to understand pulse oximetry, including its limitations. And finally, to understand the basics of capnography, including the significance of the PaCO2, PeTO2 gradient. So the first topic is the arterial blood gas. This is a collection of labs sent on a sample of arterial blood, often drawn through a puncture in the radial artery as seen here. It is also often drawn through an arterial line, particularly in intubated ICU patients, where serial samples can be drawn and compared without the need for additional punctures. The blood is then injected into a small cartridge, which is usually fed into a handheld ABG analyzer. This is a picture of the iStat, one, of, one particular model of ABG analyzer, which is one of the most commonly used such device in the United States. Depending upon the exact model of analyzer and on the type of cartridge used, the ABG can provide an array of various measurements. However, the three values usually of greatest interest are the arterial pH, the PaO2, or arterial oxygen tension, and the PaCO2, or arterial carbon dioxide tension. Let's take a more in-depth look at the physiologic parameters the ABG reports to us. In addition to the three I just mentioned, all ABGs also report the serum bicarbonate level as well as the arterial O2 saturation. What do we do with these values? The pH, PaCO2, and bicarb is used in determining the acid-base status of the patient. Although this is an important component of the patient's evaluation, it falls outside the scope of this particular lecture series on mechanical ventilation. Next, the PaCO2 alone tells us about the status of the patient's ventilation. If you watched lecture four, you may remember the alveolar ventilation equation, which told us that the partial pressure of CO2 in arterial blood was equal to the product of the rate of systemic CO2 production and the pressure of inspired air divided by alveolar ventilation. Therefore, if the PaCO2 can be measured, the systemic CO2 production is usually assumed based on the situation, and pressure of inspired air is also known, alveolar ventilation can be calculated. Finally, the PaCO2, PaO2, and the O2 saturation tell us about the patient's oxygenation. You may also remember the alveolar gas equation from lecture four, which allows one to calculate alveolar oxygen tension from PaCO2 and the alveolar to arterial oxygen gradient provides important information regarding the adequacy of a patient's alveolar arterial membrane through which these gases are diffusing. One last point about these values from the ABG concerns how they are determined by the machine. So the big three, that is the pH, the PaCO2, and the PaO2 are all measured directly, while the bicarb is calculated using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, and the O2 saturation is calculated using a complicated nomogram relating PaO2 and temperature. Once again, the PaCO2 is used to calculate P alveolar O2 and to estimate alveolar ventilation, and the P little a O2 is used to calculate the AA gradient. We'll now move on to pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry provides a real-time measurement of the percentage of hemoglobin that is bound to oxygen in arterial blood. Here's a picture of a typical pulse oximeter probe. It is usually a small hinged device that loosely clamps around the fingertip. There are also probes that are much thinner and actually taped directly to the patient's skin for less artifact and less chance of becoming dislodged. How does this device work? To understand that, we need to look at a chart relating the relative degree of light absorption of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin over a range of wavelengths. Here is the absorption curve for oxygenated hemoglobin. 
There's a net air of absorption around 660 nanometers, which falls into the red zone in the visible light spectrum. Thus, this is why oxygenated hemoglobin appears red, because it preferentially reflects and transmits that range of light wavelengths. Here's the absorption curve for deoxygenated hemoglobin. It has lower absorption in the infrared range of above 800 nanometers. To determine the relative concentrations of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, pulse oximeters emit light specifically at 660 nanometers and 940 nanometers, and then look at the relative amount of light at those wavelengths which is transmitted through the tissue. The degree of light transmission at 660 nanometers is mostly a function of the concentration of oxygenated hemoglobin, while the degree of light transmission at 940 nanometers is mostly a function of the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin. The actual algorithms used by the oximeter to make these specific calculations are quite complicated and beyond the scope of this lecture. However, once the concentrations of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin have been determined, here's the equation used to calculate the specific O2 saturation. It is the ratio of oxygenated hemoglobin to total hemoglobin times 100. This is a very simple schematic of how this looks in the actual pulse oximeter probe. A light emitter on one side with a photodetector on the other. The two wavelengths of light are then shown through the tissue and detected out on the other side. The photodetectors only register transmitted light of alternating intensity. Otherwise, a pulse oximeter would erroneously report values based on light transmission through veins and extravascular tissue. Pulse oximetry has a long list of potential limitations that are reported in the literature, though uh, luckily most are very rare causes of false readings. Uh, they inc include uh, movement artifact, dyshemoglobinemias, uh, methylene blue, profound anemia, profound hypoxia, profound hypotension, hypothermia, ambient electromagnetic radiation, exceptionally bright ambient light such as in an operating room, and certain shades of nail polish. So now, let's move on to capnography. Capnography provides a continuous measurement of carbon dioxide tension in expired air, which can serve as a real-time surrogate for carbon dioxide tension in arterial blood. Most capnography utilizes infrared spectrography. An emitter and photodetector are placed along the ventilator tubing. The emitter produces light in the infrared electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, then certain wavelengths of infrared light are selectively absorbed by carbon dioxide. Therefore, the less light at those wavelengths that are detected, the greater the concentration of interposed carbon dioxide. As may be apparent, it's a similar principle to that used in pulse oximetry. Continuous capnography produces a waveform for each breath, which has a characteristic shape and is known as a capnogram. Abnormalities of the shape and magnitude can provide some information about a patient's cardiopulmonary system. Here's a typical capnogram with uh, PCO2 in expired air as a function of time. There are typically described four phases of the capnogram. Phase one consists of the exhalation of CO2-free gas in the anatomic dead space, including ventilator tubing distal to the CO2 detector. Phase two consists of the exhalation of a mixture of alveolar and dead space gas. Phase three, during which a plateau is usually reached, consists solely of exhaled alveolar gas. And finally, phase four, which some sources label as phase zero, uh, consists of inhalation, at which point the CO2 concentration rapidly drops back to zero. As I pointed out, during phase three, the PCO2 level plateaus out. The maximum value of the PCO2 of expired gas reached just prior to inhalation is called the end tidal CO2 and is abbreviated PETCO2. End tidal CO2 is important because it can serve as a rough surrogate for P arterial CO2 as the difference between these two values is relatively small and is relatively constant over the range of possible values of alveolar ventilation. Therefore, an unexpected change in end tidal CO2 can indicate an unexpected change in the PaCO2, 
which can be the first sign of a change in alveolar ventilation. While changes in ventilation typically do not impact the arterial endotidal CO2 gradient per se, a number of other pathologic processes can. For example, if the arterial to end tidal CO2 gradient is higher than 5 millimeters of mercury, it suggests low cardiac output or any cause of worsened VQ mismatch, such as COPD, pulmonary embolism, or in the, in the senile changes in the lung that are seen with advanced age and are the same changes that lead to higher normal alveolar arterial oxygen gradients in the elderly population. Unusually small PaCO2 to end tidal CO2 gradients are rare, but can be seen in states of very high cardiac output, such as septic shock. Beyond changes in the PaCO2 to end tidal CO2 gradient, changes in the shape of the capnogram can also indicate potential pathology. The most common abnormal morphology is this, which is sometimes referred to as a, quote, shark fin capnogram. Here, a plateau of the CO2 tension during phase three doesn't occur. This is highly suggestive of high airway resistance, such as that seen during an acute asthma exacerbation. To give you an, an idea of how one might view all of this data in real time, here's a picture of a uh, typical bedside monitor that might be found in the ICU, uh, or even that might be portable and, and actually transport it with a patient um, around the hospital. Uh, the top line in green is the heart's electrical activity or telemetry. The next line in purple is the pulse oximetry with a normal value of 100. Uh, we didn't actually discuss the morphology of the adjacent pulse ox waveform, but it's rarely clinically useful, particularly when there is a concurrent arterial pressure tracing that provides more direct data, shown here in red. Next line down in light blue is the capnography, showing here a normal value of 40. Uh, the bottom line is in, uh, in white is the res respiratory rate and pattern, which is particularly prone to artifact and which should not be trusted over a healthcare provider's direct observations. And finally, the yellow 37 in the bottom right corner is the patient's temperature, uh, which may be provided via a number of different ways, including a bladder catheter or pulmonary artery catheter. That concludes this lecture on how to monitor gas exchange in the mechanically ventilated patient. Uh, please continue on to the next lecture covering non-invasive positive pressure ventilation.